Hello, my name is Joe Campion from Quadrant Building Control. Um, today I'm going to give you quite a, a long talk and a, a deep dive, as we're calling it, into the changes to the building regulations Partel coming out, coming out in 2022. What we've tried to do with this is to answer some of the questions which we think you might be asking in a bit more detail. Now, please be aware this is an informal chat about the changes to the building regulations rather than a definitive interpretation of what is actually being provided. So please don't report me to the police if you think I've said anything wrong. There will be chapters at the bottom of the screen, so you can uh, look at the chapters, see which ones are of interest to you, and you can go straight to them, or you can look at them all um, uh, one after the other or on different days. Um, but if you really want to, you can sit through the whole lot and listen to me talk about Partel for the next uh, hour and a half. I think um, the biggest change which I can see in this new 2022 edition of Partel is the fact that we're seeing an end to gas boilers in new build dwellings and potentially they're, they're looking at removing these from existing buildings as well in the future. There's a real commitment by the government or from the government to decarbonise the, the, the built environment and our energy generation systems. And part of this involves trying to replace gas boilers with either hydrogen boilers or air source heat pump boilers. This was always something they were driving towards, but it's really started to come to the fore now. And I think in the 2022 Partel, most new build dwellings will have heat pump boilers and by 2025 which is the future home standards i can see virtually all new build dwellings having heat pump boilers i think they've uh, they've they pushed it back to 2050 and potentially they could even make it a bit further, uh, a bit earlier um, but I think they've taken a, a bit of a pragmatic view and um, no matter what they can always make things happen earlier but generally the sooner you make them happen the more uh, uh, cost is involved and the longer you can make things happen and, uh, and plan for the changes the less impact there is economically. Um, originally the 2006 edition of Partel came, came out and that was a big change um, over 10 years ago now and, and when that uh, edition of the building regs came out they had set in, uh, set in time a, uh, a set of uh, sort of phases to change the approved document from uh, uh, 2006 to 2010, 2013 and 2016. And in 2016 they were talking about um, zero carbon homes and that was a standard that they were, were looking to um, back in 2006. They had a 10 year plan to make all new dwellings zero carbon by 2016. And I can remember going around the BRE's um, uh, 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 exhibitions in their uh, their um, uh, offices in uh, in Watford, and uh, they had a whole series of uh, zero carbon homes which were constructed as as exemplars of what could be achieved, and that's what the ambition was at the time. And we got to 2013, and there was a bit of a, a hard stop, and the 2016 star target got um, in effect kicked into the long grass. Uh, but it's been brought back as the 2025 future home standard and it's been adapted slightly in that it's it's now a, a net zero carbon rather than true zero carbon so the way they've they're classing zero carbon is uh, uh is slightly changed as well but because of that small pause uh, or small pause about a 10 year pause and also uh, the way the uh, technologies have been able to catch up and develop and the support that's been given. Um, I can personally see that uh, 2025 uh, we'll have zero carbon homes and I don't think that's going to be too big a challenge. And then going on from that, I can quite honestly see that uh, most or, or, or this 2050 target for getting everything to zero carbon um, is achievable. It's, it's not impossible anymore.
This will be a stepping stone. So we've got the 2022 Partel, which is coming out next year. And then that's going to be a halfway house between, or supposed to be a halfway house between where we are now in 2013 edition of Partel and the 2025 edition. So there will be a new Partel coming out at 2025, and that will be the net zero carbon um, standard for new house or for new homes and new houses. We're not quite sure what the standard will be for non-domestic buildings, but I suspect it's going to be close to, if not potentially, net zero carbon themselves. But um, my gut feeling, um, which is all we've really got to, to go at the moment, it's just a bit of a guess, I can't see them going for net zero carbon for non-domestic buildings in 2025. Almost certainly, yeah. This, uh, this is definitely going to mean we're asking you for a lot more paperwork when you get your building regulations approval. F first of all, at the moment, we ask for uh, commissioning certificates, air test certificates, uh, commissioning certificates for your heating and for your hot water systems, uh, uh, the EPCs, air test certificates. And, uh, and now we're going to be starting to ask for a, uh, a, d a design stage assessment of, uh, of the building details for uh, thermal bridging, uh, for continuity of insulation and for air, air leakage design. And we're going to ask for um, the on-site audit uh, uh, and, uh, and check sheets to confirm that those designs have been correctly installed on site. Uh, we're going, that's going to include photographic records and a sign-off sheet, which has to be uh, completed by the uh, by the uh, by the developer um, or the installer, so that there's accountability for um, for what's actually been built. And the hope is that if they do this, um, it's going to uh, close this performance gap between the design. Uh, uh, assessment and what the building is designed to achieve in terms of its energy use and uh, what it actually achieves in real life. So uh, yeah, it's just uh, more bits of paperwork which we're going to ask people to fill in and send through to us, I'm afraid. You can make a building regulation application and uh, get that recorded as, uh, as lodged and accepted. And then you can then start work within a set period of time, usually a 12 month period from when the new approved document comes in. And if you have your application in before the start date and you start on site within a year, you can carry on building to the old standards before these new approved documents or the new changes came in. So it's a way of locking in your building under the current edition of the building regulations rather than having to respond to the new edition of the building regulations. Start on site is a meaningful start on site and that is generally considered to be foundations or drainage, piling, um, digging a hole, putting concrete in. That's that's proper starting on site. You can't go onto a site and uh, start doing some uh, uh, demolition work you can't do some ground movement and digging uh, uh, cut and fill and such like or putting roads and sewers in it's a bit of a, a gray area as to exactly what constitutes a start on site but generally it's foundations and uh, and drainage work which is specifically related to that particular plot i think um I'd like to think anyway that most developers would uh, would take a pragmatic approach to this and if they have got a, a scheme which is um, uh, on the books or ready to go then that's the sort of scheme which these transitional provisions are, are designed and, and therefore to take uh, advantage of. Um, what they shouldn't really be doing is uh, is putting applications in for jobs they haven't even got planning permission on. If they've got a, uh, a bit of land and uh, they want to uh, to put an application in for, for 50 dwellings uh, but haven't even got planning permission, it's unlikely that they're going to get planning permission and start on site within a year. The detailed design hasn't really been done. Um, that, those are the sort of sites where it's, it's not really designed to, uh, uh, to accommodate those sort of buildings. And, uh, and I'd like to think that most developers would just take a, uh, a view on that, that actually it's just not going to work. So don't even go down the, down the route and try it. There's also um, uh, the, the overarching uh, issue of if somebody is buying a house in five years time and it's still being constructed to 2013 edition because uh, a developer went in and put a hundred foundations in, um, they're, they're going to 
they're not, that's not going to be what their expectation is. If they see that every other housing site is built to the 2022 standards, you've got uh, better U values, you've got more efficient heating systems, that's really what they would be expecting. So if, uh, if you do construct to the old standards and it's many years down the line after the, the, uh, the changes to the regs and most other sites um, are building to the 2022 standards, there'll be a mismatch there between what the customer expects and what they're actually being delivered. Whenever you've got that sort of situation as a developer, you, uh, you generally know that there's going to be a few, uh, few issues and problems down the line. It, it's just almost inevitable that that might happen. So I, I would always recommend take advantage of the transi transitional provisions if it's appropriate for your site, but don't try to game the system because it's probably just not worth it in the long run. Um, if you're doing a, uh, a conversion scheme for, say, office to residential or PD development or anything like that, um, you'll still need to meet the standards within the new Part L um, if you can't take advantage of these transitional provisions. However, the, the, the difference between the, uh, the uh, standards in the 2022 Part L and the 20, 20, 2013 edition of Part L for things like a change of use aren't significant really. There are some smaller changes there, often to do with uh, uh, construction on site and uh, um, the uh, on site audits and such like. But, uh, but in terms of the U Valley standards and the heating systems which you'll be putting in, uh, they'll stay pretty much the same as the 2013 edition. So it's not such a big change for that. If you've got a, a block of flats and uh, you're looking at having to uh, to heat those with air source heat pumps, that does become more difficult. Um, if you've got external living space for uh, balconies, you can often put them out on balconies, uh, but then you get a whole load of these uh, external condensers which are buzzing away um, all the way through the night. Um, the the there is a um, a bit of an idea really that the the likely outcome for large blocks of flats especially will not be uh, small individual uh, heat pump uh, boilers within each apartment uh, communal heating systems will probably be the way that they'll go so there'll be one uh, larger uh, heat, heat pump unit potentially even a ground source heat pump unit uh, uh, down in the basement which will uh, provide the heating and hot water for the whole of the uh, the apartment block and then that will be distributed um, uh, through a heating network into individual apartments and uh, and then metered as they go into the apartments so that's likely to be the more common uh, scenario on larger uh, blocks of apartments smaller blocks of apartments they could well have individual heat pump units because those uh, district heating networks are quite expensive and you need quite a lot large number of units to actually make it stack up um, but again you could have a smaller system um, which is one heat pump boiler uh, which is a landlord supply and then that would uh, uh, pump around to all the apartments on smaller developments so uh, there, there are other options around there, but uh, they, they are, I think on larger uh, blocks of apartments, district heating networks are, are likely to be the way they're going to go. Uh, in terms of domestic apartments, I think it's unlikely. The government are really trying to prevent or, or trying to discourage um, air conditioning units to be put into new build apartments. Um, at the moment, uh, air conditioning units are routinely put into commercial buildings and, uh, and that has, uh, it, it hasn't helped in terms of uh, reducing the country's energy use. Uh, because if a building was just heated during the winter and you had openable windows during the summer or people just got very hot, um, uh, it might not have been a comfortable environment for people within the building, but actually in terms of the energy use of that building, um, you only had heating in the winter, so therefore the energy use was lower. And when you put air conditioning into buildings, generally the energy use of that building will increase. So the government are quite keen to avoid ha that happening to domestic dwellings. And as part of the, the link with Part L, 
we've got these new additions of Part L which have come out. To go hand in hand with these, there have been some changes to Part F of the building regulations, which is to do with ventilation. And within these approved documents as well, there's um, a sections about reducing the risk of overheating within existing buildings and new buildings. So the government are trying to, uh, to tie the various parts of the building regulations together so that if we make buildings more energy efficient um, uh, with less heat loss and, uh, and lower air leakage and, uh, and fewer thermal bridges, uh, we are still providing adequate levels of ventilation so you've got a good internal environment and, uh, and they're not hopefully going to overheat. The, the hope is that uh, when, when new uh, buildings are completed and they're occupied by uh, owners or, or tenants, um, what the owners and tenants will experience is uh, a, a more a stable interior environment um, and lower heating costs and, uh, or, or lower energy costs all around really. Um, and when I say a, a more stable internal environment, uh, what we're really saying there is uh, they don't get these cold spots, drafts and uh, um, uh, thermal bridging and, uh, and potentially uh, uh, cold, cold areas on the wall, floors, roof, uh, which then could potentially start uh, uh, attracting condensation and mould growth. So it's, it's a, a better internal environment um, and uh, a better quality product, which is uh, one of the things the government are really keen on trying to push forward. With, with all this as well, there should be lower energy uh, use, which should then translate to lower energy bills as well. So uh, the buildings should become more energy efficient. And if they become more energy efficient, then uh, uh, there is the expectation that they'll become more um, uh, uh, economic to run and to use um, but um, that's uh, that's assuming that uh, energy prices don't uh, creep up at the same time as your energy use goes down. The, the new Partel has also included some changes to, uh, to existing buildings, so existing dwellings. Um, when you're extending your dwelling, doing the house extension or some alterations, uh, they have changed the U-value standards which are required for uh, Partel 2022. Um, under the 2000, well, it's actually the 2010 edition of Partel, which is the one we're currently using for extensions and alterations. Um, the U values were 0.28 for walls, uh, I think it's 0.18 for, for roofs, um, or 1.6 if it's a, a loft, uh, and 0.22 uh, for, um, uh, for floors. Uh, these have been improved, and uh, there's a, 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 a more, um, more ambitious U value targets which have been introduced for this. Um, the, uh, especially with, with walls, that's uh, improved or, or gone down from 0.28 all the way down to 0.18 uh, for, new, for, for new walls. And that's quite a big jump, um, which is likely to have quite a big impact on new build or sorry, on extensions to existing houses. So uh, that's probably the biggest change there. Uh, floors have gone down from 0.22 to 0.18 and uh, uh, roofs have gone down from 0.16 to 0.15. He says, just looking at his notes. Uh, yeah, if you're doing renovation work to an existing building, um, there's always been a requirement for you to, uh, to do some thermal upgrades if your renovation work is quite significant, um, depending on what the, uh, uh, the area of the renovation work is in relation to the area of that particular room or the external uh, elevation that you're working on. Um, but again, those changes haven't really, they're, they're, there's some very small changes there. They're, the changes which are, have been made aren't really going to affect that. So if you're doing work to the existing house um, and you're just renovating a thermal element, uh, it's pretty much the same as the 2010 edition of Partel. Um, but if you are putting a new roof on, so you're taking one roof off and putting a new roof on, that would be a new thermal element and then you'd have to come up to the new standards. Obviously, if you're doing an extension, that's a new thermal element. So it's a new wall, new floor, new roof, new windows. They would have to come up to the new standard. One of the other changes which they're really driving um, under the new Part L2 
is uh, within the SAP, sorry, the SBEM calculation, um, there was only the carbon emission calculation where you had to meet a CO2 target um, within the L2A. Um, but now there's a carbon emission target and also a primary energy use target. So they've introduced a new, um, a new metric which you have to, uh, to either get a pass or fail on as well as the CO2 target, there's primary energy use. And, and it's, this is almost bringing it back in a full circle because before carbon emissions were, uh, were discussed um, in the 2006 uh, part and introduced as part of the assessment methodology in 2006, we were always really talking about making buildings more energy efficient. We then moved to more carbon efficient and uh, trying to look for carbon efficient heating systems and such like. Uh, but now we're going back to uh, looking for primary energy use as well and trying to make buildings more energy efficient because the, uh, the carbon emission target is not going to be quite so challenging to achieve under the 2020 uh, Part L because the way the uh, electrical energy is generated within the country and as electrical uh, energy or electricity is the more usual heating, uh, lighting, hot water, cooling, ventilation uh, uh, energy source on, uh, on non-domestic buildings, the fact that the electricity grid has been decarbonised has meant that the carbon emissions associated with new buildings just has naturally reduced. So to combat that, they've also introduced this primary energy uh, use matrix as well to try and reduce the amount of energy that's used as well as reduce the amount of carbon. One thing which I, uh, I did uh, forget to talk about really, um, with the new build non-domestic construction, um, there is still some uh, emphasis placed on the as-built construction. So although you're not going to the same lengths as being, has been recommended or suggested within the domestic properties, um, there is still some onus on the developer to ensure that the design is robust enough and, uh, and detailed uh, sufficiently to ensure continuity of insulation, uh, limiting air leakage and uh, reducing thermal bridging, and also that it has been constructed adequately to address those details. The, the level of information that's required for building regulations approval by, uh, by the building inspector is not the same as uh, domestic uh, dwellings, but there is still some emphasis placed on that and there is a responsibility on the builders uh, to ensure that those details are constructed correctly. There is a bit of a change, quite a small change, and it's a bit of a detail change uh, to uh, the amount of insulation which is required about uh, around primary heating systems. So it's uh, the hot water uh, circulation systems for the space heating and the domestic hot water systems. Uh, previously under the uh, approved document, there was a requirement to insulate when it goes into an unheated space or it's outside the, uh, the thermal envelope of the building. Uh, within the new part L, they do specifically mention um, voids within the building. So if you're taking your hot water or heating pipe work through a void and um, within the building, that should now be insulated. So if you've got a hot water heating system which is going through potentially a floor void, that should be insulated possibly even if it's taken behind plasterboard because that is forming a void which is outside the, um, uh, the uh, or, or physical envelope of that particular room. Whereas before um, it was the, the, the heating system, um, if it was an un uninsulated bit of pipe work, um, it wasn't seen to be too big an issue because it was still within, the, the heat would still be uh, circulating into the room that the uh, pipe work was serving. But if it's within a, a void, um, it's actually uh, then more likely to, uh, uh, to be waste heat rather than useful heat. So the, the, the guidance has made specific reference to voids. I think uh, floor voids is quite clear that that should that now be insulated. Um, I think there is a little bit of discussion to be had as to how it's going to be interpreted uh, regarding any hot, uh, hot water pipe work which goes behind plasterboards.
One of the things that did surprise me with the new uh, 2090 or 2021 um, consultation on Partel was that they have omitted the homeowner affordability test within the SAP calculation. This was something that was proposed and was in the 2019 consultation. And it was a way of trying to ensure that new build dwellings weren't built with electric panel heaters, as these do tend to be much more expensive to, to run and use when heating a building than uh, gas boilers. And they were trying to avoid uh, people moving from gas boilers to electric panel heaters and trying to, to migrate people from gas boilers to air source heat pump boilers or ground source heat pump boilers. Uh, personally, I think, uh, I think they've got it about right. Um, whenever you're looking at uh, changing to or changes to the building regulations, there's always a balance between what you're actually trying to achieve um, and actually how much it's going to cost, because any change costs money. And if it costs too much, then you suddenly find that you're stopping development. And there's always a pressure, um, especially on new build housing, uh, that there is a housing need and uh, we've got to deliver that. So uh, and at the end of the day, if uh, the costs go up, quite significantly, um, it's, uh, it's you and me who are going to be paying for that by more expensive houses. Um, so it, there has to be a balance between the two. Um, I think they've got it about right. Um, if, you, uh, if you've got more of a, uh, an environmental uh, bent or, or perspective, then they, there's always, they'd like to see them go further and sooner. Um, but uh, they have made a commitment to, uh, to net zero carbon um, uh, by 2025 for new dwellings. Um, I think the whole country is moving to this uh, net zero carbon target in the future after that. Um, I think they've got it just about right. Um, it, it's fine, fine lines and fine margins, but uh, in the round, I think they're, they're just about there. Uh, well, apart from this video, of course, um, they, uh, there are uh, some other um, uh, websites which are available. Um, SIBSI have got some, uh, some uh, guidance about it. There's also the, uh, the uh, energy assessment companies. Uh, a lot of those have uh, produced some very good guidance about um, uh, the changes to Partel. Predominantly, it's all to do with new build housing. There's not a huge amount of, uh, of guidance about what the changes are to, uh, to L2, um, but uh, there's quite a bit out there in terms of L1. Um, so uh, it's, it's generally the energy assessment uh, companies. And, uh, and if you are a developer or an architect and you've got a relationship with uh, energy assessors and you ask them to do most of your energy assessments, either domestic or non-domestic, um, probably the first thing to do is to have a chat with them about it as well. If you do want to have a chat about Partel or anything which has been covered in this video, feel free to give me a ring. I'm always quite happy to have a talk about it. Um, I hope that's been helpful um, and uh, thank you very much for watching.